Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we're glad that you're joining us again for another part of our series on ancient wisdom for foolish days. I did want you to make you aware that the sermon slides for all of these uh, messages are on the church's website, on our blog post. So if you ever kind of go back and there's something that you want to rethink about or you want to share with somebody, uh, you can go and do that. Uh, we have not only the sermon slides, but also a link to the video so that you can watch those again. And I'm hoping that each time that we do this, that you're gaining something out of it that, that is helping you in your spiritual life. We started out by asking the fundamental question, what is the wise thing to do? Now, for Christians... That's an essential. That's part of what we signed up for. You know, God is saying, you know, leave behind the, the life of the world that you live in and ask, what is the wise thing? What is the, the right thing to do? Not just what is the easy thing or what is the legal thing, but what is the wise thing to do? And so for the last couple of weeks, we've been having this conversation uh, with Michael and Sean, and they've come back. We're going to take another look at this passage because there's so much here. And if you really think about it, if you think about not only your life, but the life of your family, your kids, if you can get them to actually ask, and if you could get your kids, and, and for all of us at every stage of our lives, to ask that question, what is the wise thing to do in this situation? I mean, think about how transformational um, that would really be. So we started by thinking about this based on Ephesians chapter 5, and, and I didn't ask you to memorize that, so I'm not going to ask you to quote it, but... It, in Ephesians, Paul is trying to say, this is how you live different life. This is how you live differently. And Paul talks about all of the, the differences, especially in a, in a very Roman-dominated uh, secular culture. But he says then to the, his friends in Ephesians, he said, now be careful then how you live, not as unwise. Don't do stupid stuff, but do wise things. Making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. They, they, and, and I think that that's such a beautiful phrase because it's talking about how God has a plan for you, right? You're not here by accident. The situation that you find yourself in is not just by happenstance. It's not just serendipity. It's just God has a plan. How will we respond to the forces that are in our lives? Now, I said last time, and we've been doing this for the uh, last couple of weeks, what are those boundary issues, those three key boundary issues, the three core things that if we can embed them in our brain will help guide us? And I mean, do you remember what those three are? I know, yeah, go ahead. I mean, just... You want to try Yeah, I'd love to try them, especially because <laughs> there's a slide up that says, <laughs> I'll take this one. <laughs> I am who God says I am. Thank you guys in the back. I can do what God says I can do, and then I will become all that God created me to be. Everybody, uh, he just, he sounded the big words out and he yep. got them all. Hey. There we go. That's how I live my life. There we go. So here's the thing I wanted to ask. I mean, how, how many critical decisions, you know, have you made in your life or that people make that have a, a huge impact? Um, some of them are, are small, but some of them play out in, in large ways. And, and I've often said in the past that you make your choices and then your choices make you. Right? But the point is, is how often have you ever said something like, you know, if I'd have known then what I know now, and actually there's a whole program of saying, if you were to write a letter to your teenage self, what would you say based on what you, you know now? I mean, if you could go back and relive those days. And the question really is, is why is it that it's such a struggle? Why is it that we look and we say, if I knew then what I know now? You know, why is it that we so struggle with that? Now, there's a couple of things that I, I've learned uh, by watching uh, people over, over the years. And the, and the thing is, is, have you ever noticed that sometimes you can look at other people's lives and what they're doing and saying, that's not going to work out so well? That, that you're able to look at other people and see problems that are going to arise, mistakes, pathways that they're going down that they can't see. You know, you're able from an outside perspective of saying, you know, if, if I could just talk to my younger self or if I could just talk to them based on my experience, but you're able to see it. But the problem is, is we're not able to see it in ourselves, right? I mean, there's probably other people that look at, look at us and kind of go, I, I can see big mistakes that they're going to get ready to make. And I think that there's a couple of reasons why people don't chime in and they don't say, look, I mean, first of all, 
they don't feel comfortable that you're going to receive it well, that, that I'm going to receive it well. You know, that, well, he's just being, he's just being mean. He doesn't, you know, have, maybe as, as kids, like, well, my parents, right? My parents just, you know, they don't really understand me. You never want me to have any fun. You know, they, we, don't, we don't listen. We don't listen very well. I mean, have you ever had that experience even in your own life that you've thought of, of like, you know, dealing either with your family or, or even as you personally? Oh, absolutely, especially with teenage kids. Um, to your point about um, <clears throat> trying to develop a story and deliver it to them that so it doesn't seem like you're judging them or preaching to them. You know, the Bible tells us, though, to, that Christians should not only accept discipline but be willing to admonish people. Mm -hmm. And it's not about browbeating them. Yeah. It's trying to formulate a message to say, listen, I've been down that path, um, and here's the, the potential consequences that could result from those decisions, yeah. so you might want to think about those things. Um, you know, not to, uh, not to bring rap into the sermon, um, but, the, you know, but it is the, covered it everything is else. Why it, is the, you know, it can't be the people's poetry. Not all rap's bad, but there, there's a lyric from 25, 30 years ago that says, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. And yeah. young people might understand that, that every decision you make, you might want to stop and think about it and make sure you're making the right decision because yourself is the best gift that God gave you. It's the only thing you control yeah. in life is yourself. Right. And so if you don't preserve that gift, then you're going to really damage it potentially. Yeah. So. That's a really interesting perspective too because as a, as a you know, early 30s, I guess, I'm kind of in that, I feel like I'm kind of in that tra transitional period between I think I know everything and I need to, I want to learn everything. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are times in my life where like, Psh, I can figure that out. Like, I don't, I don't need to listen to anybody. I can figure that out. And then you get to the other side of that and go, well, I should have listened to what so-and-so told me. But then also like, you know, owning our own business and having little kids too. We also are going to people like our parents and going, what do we do when they do this? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm actually really interested in this <laughs> topic. Um, because I feel like I'm kind of in limbo between those two things. I want to still believe that I, you know, can do all things and everything will turn out great. But what I realize is I should probably ask some people who've been there before. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I think what one of the, the, the strengths that we never, I think one of the hidden uh, gems of a, of a church or, or it's a deep well is if you had, now granted we're here in an empty sanctuary, but if you had 200 people, and you so, let's just assume that the average age is, say, 50. You have 10,000 years of experience, of life experience. Everything that you're going through. I, I remember when, when we were raising our kids. And, you know, the kids are, are going nuts. And I went to my mom and said, oh, you have no idea what this is like. These kids are just... And she's going, really? Really? That kind of thing. You know, in cars, they have, like, the, the little oil light. That, you know, it's called an idiot light. You know, the idea of like going, if you don't pay attention to it, you know, this is the fabric of, of what you're going into. So the question is, is we know, right? I mean, no, this, is not, this is not rocket science. Like we're going, don't you want to make wise decisions? If you went to teenagers and you said, don't you want to make wise, you know, would a teenager ever say, no, I, I, I'm hoping to make some, some stupid decision. No, everybody wants to do it. So why don't we do it? Why don't we do it? Well, and, I, and this is the subject that we're going to take on, how to, how to get there. There's a couple of reasons. And the first one is, is that emotionally charged situations are horrible for making decisions. I mean, w would you agree with that? As a matter of fact, oftentimes what they'll tell you is like for, for people, widowers after a death or after a major life shift, don't make major decisions because they are emotionally charged. And so we understand that whenever there's a lot of emotion in this, a lot of your identity is turned, you know, especially with, with teens, you know, teens, you know, people saying, I, I've, I've lived a full life. I'm 17 now. I know most of what life is about. And, you know, mom and dad, you're old school. You don't understand, but I understand what's really going on. It's an emotionally charged, and it is a horrible time to make decisions because you're not making a... Re That's where we from people from the outside saying, have you ever heard somebody say, um, I don't have a horse in this race. I, I can make a decision based on what I see because whether you accept it or not, I'm gonna sleep good tonight, right? I don't have anything invested in, but I'm gonna tell you the truth. 
But here's the, here's the downside. All big decisions are, are emotionally charged. Every big decision about who you are and about what you're going to do is emotionally charged. It's something about your identity. And so when we talk about teens and, and even people our age, about you know, the house that you buy or something like that. And I was actually thinking about, imagine if a friend of yours came up and said, man, I, you know, at, at, our, at our age and said, I wanna buy this red sports car. I just, oh, I love it. It's just, it, oh, it looks great. You know, and, and I can see myself driving it. And if you go to the parking, if you go to the dealership, what do they want you to do? Take it for a test drive. See yourself in it, right? Immess yourself in it. Emotionally get involved with it. Now, from an outsider's perspective, I'm going, I, why do you need that? Right? Is, oh, it's all ego. You're, you're paying for ego. I can see that, right? I mean, that's what you're paying for. It's your identity. But the person that is, oh, no, 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 that's not it. That's not, it, it'd just be a great, right? It's a great deal. No, it's not. You're going to be paying for this through the nose for a long time. You're paying for your ego, for your identity is enmeshed in that. Now, here's the key, is that wise people know that all things are emotionally charged. So here's the question then I'm, I'm, we're going to lay out. So what is it that you do when emotions are high and your appetite are running wild? I, I want it. Right now, last time, what did we talk about last time? Human sexuality, emotionally charged, right? And if you don't have some guidance prior to that, you're, you're doomed, right? I mean, that was the parable that we talked about in Proverbs chapter 7. The young man's going down. He doesn't even understand. He is so intoxicated. He does not even understand that he's already going to the slaughter already going down. So the question is, let me ask you the question, what is, what is the answer? When, a, when your teens or you, any of us are in a situation that is emotionally charged and your appetites are just going wild, what is it that you can do? I've, I've learned this and I'll, I'll uh, kind of tell you why. <clears throat> when we had our second um, kiddo, Olive, I had, I had uh, countless patients during, you know, over the course of uh, Carly's pregnancy, come up and say, you know, I can tell you how that happens so that you can avoid that in the future if you want to. And I don't know that that's the, the wise <laughs> counsel that I was seeking, but what I've realized is um, that's kind of a funny way to explain kind of all of those emotional decisions. You know, we were, we were ready for another child. So we made an emotional decision to you know, expand our family. But when, when talking about just everyday decisions in our lives, um, that wise counsel has a, I say wise counsel because that's obviously how, how we learned about this, but that wise counsel has a way of finding it, finding its way to us, whether we want it to or not. There's always somebody there to, that's willing to give us that opinion. It's just whether we're ready to, to, to listen to it, to hear it, mm -hmm. um, or to go, tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, not necessarily about that topic. I figured that one out. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think just being able to, you know, and I've done this with you as well. Like, hey, Sean, can I just grab you for a couple minutes? I just want to run something by you because I know that he's got experience in that um, area of life or, or expertise. But I mean, I think, you know, just the few people sitting around here, I, I think I've done that with everybody. Hey, can I just pick your brain for a couple minutes? Um, and just being able to get a, a different perspective that's based in experience uh, or life experience um, gives that kind of fresh outlook so that you can separate yourself emotionally from some of those decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, we're kind of doing this with our business right now. Do we want to do this? Is this an emotional decision? Does it actually get us anywhere? We should talk to some people who have some experience with this and see how it turned out for them. Mm -hmm. So that's two things to that. One, I totally agree that, and it doesn't change <clears throat> with age. I mean, every year that passes, there's still a lesson that you can mm. learn from someone else, especially if you are wise. <laughs> um, because uh, there's people that have done things that I've never done and will never will do. There's people to, that have experienced things that I, you know, may never experience, but it can still give me some sort of context or perception about a situation. <clears throat> but the second part of that that I've, I've learned, you know, 
that you always should seek counsel if you can, but there's going to be times in life that you can't. Mm -hmm. It's more spontaneous. And to harken back to another contemporary colloquialism, don't press send, meaning, you know, <laughs> you might be charged up about something and not even just face to face and you want to send a text, you want to send an email, don't do it. But just like if you, if you and I were having an argument and, and you're pushing me to make a decision and I'm not comfortable and I know I'm emotionally charged, I try to tell other people, count to 10, step away. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other thing is just to try to um, compose yourself. You know, it's not just about seeking wise counsel. It's maybe seeking within, just mm -hmm. taking a breath and, and uh, like I said, trying to, to pull yourself back together at least to say, yay or nay for now, you know, mm -hmm. whether it's the long-term decision. Yeah, actually, you know, when I, when I do counseling, uh, premarital counseling, I'm saying, you know, sometimes arguments between couples will spiral. And there's actually a book called The Crazy Cycle because it'll get out of control. And it's, the, the idea is, is learn to, to read your emotions. Like, you know, I, I can feel my blood pressure rising and, and, and we're going from discussing to shouting to, to you know, to. Uh, demeaning language and it's like you th the only thing you can do is get away when your emotions are high then the conversation is dropped away then the the rationality is dropped away so I want to give you one word that kind of goes to what you're saying that is the hardest word but it is the most powerful one for us to be able to make wise decisions and to have the confidence so that even even if you don't change your decision you feel more confident in the one that you're making and that's listen just taking a moment to listen, right? And now, it's, this is, you know, the question is, is like, you may be going, wow, Pastor Steve, you know, people never have thought of this before. This is, this is new. Nobody's ever heard this kind of stuff. No, I mean, we've heard it. It's just, it is so hard for us to do. We don't want to do it. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, Solomon. Now, Solomon was like, you know, when he became king after David, um, God said, you know, he was a teenager at the time he became king, and God went to him and said, you know, Solomon, ask anything. And, and Solomon said, I, what, what, you know, give, what, whatever you want, you can have. And he said, great, I, I want a new car, I want an Xbox, I want a new iPad. No, he didn't say any of that. What he did say is he said, I see the, I see the challenges ahead of me. He said, the only thing I want is wisdom. Give me wisdom. Help me to know the right thing to do. And so God did that. And as a matter of fact, in 1 Kings chapter 4, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. In verse 31, it says, He was wiser than anyone else, and his, spread, and his fame spread to all of the surrounding nations. Now, what that meant is all of the other kingdoms. Now, what this wisdom means is it doesn't mean that he knew how to do calculus, didn't need, that he knew physics, and, or that he even knew chemistry but that he knew how to read people. He knew what people did, and he, he was able to watch people's situation. This is the one where they take, you know, the two women take the one baby to Solomon. You know, he's not really gonna split the child in half, but he, he's able to understand going, uh, I, I see what, what the dement, what the, what's going on between these two. And he's able to resolve human conditions. So when he writes his letters of Proverbs, this is after a lifetime of watching what people do. So I've given you a bunch of uh, scriptures, and I want to go through them, if you don't mind reading through them, so that we can kind of discern what is the key that Solomon is really, is, is really getting at. So what is 9-9? Uh, nine, nine? Instruct the wise, and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous, and they will add to their learning. So Solomon here is clearly saying the wise can be wiser still, right? I mean, to, to your point, no matter your age, you can learn something if you're willing to be available to it. Proverbs 1.5 is, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. Again, clearly what Solomon is getting to is, is our ability to listen and, and to understand that there's more out there that perhaps we don't know than what we do know, if we're willing to be open. And, and for, so one of the keys for, for wise people is their ability to listen and to hear what other people are saying. Proverbs twelve fifteen says, the way of the fool seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. We talked about this even on the second um, time, that we, the second ser sermon in this series about you know, simple people just, they don't have the information. They just don't know. And they go down a path not understanding how things, the reality of work. But 
Solomon is very clear. Fools know that the answer is out there. They know it's out there. They just don't want to do it, whether it's an emotion. And so the question is, is sometimes when we become so emotional about a situation or about a purchase, purchases, by the way, are very intensely uh, spiritual and, and emotional. You know, you get, oh, I got a new toy. I got new, you know, and then eventually once, once you have the new car, it eventually fades. When you say, well, it looks like everybody's got that kind. Here he's kind of really talking about the ability for fools to always say, I, I already have the answer, right? And this is pro- I'll probably get some feedback on this one. But like teenagers, right? I mean, we've all done that. I bet we've all done those experiences where we're going, I already know the answer, right? I'm 17. I've got the world pretty well figured out. Solomon addresses that. Go ahead. I have a four-year-old, and he says the same thing. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 22 says, Plans fail for lack of counsel. But with many advisors, they succeed. Okay, I mean, this is a very famous one. This is the one where if you want to have success, whether it's in your business, your marriage, your finances, your relationship with God, get counselors, get people that have lived this stuff. This is why I think it's always helpful for a church to, to really honor and celebrate its, its senior adults. People that have been married, like, right, people that have been married 65 years. Can you tell me what the key is? What have you learned in 65 that'll help me, you know, in the long distance? Okay. Proverbs 19.20. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end, you will be counted among the wise. Now, what do you think he means here by discipline? Listen, listen to advice and accept discipline. That thing we're talking about, wise counsel, when someone tells you, don't do that, you're going to make the wrong decision. That's discipline. That's yeah. the true meaning of discipline. It's not punishing you. It's hopefully helping you be more rigored before you make those decisions. So. To go into it in, a, in an attitude, absolutely, to go into it in an attitude of like, well, it doesn't matter what you say. I already know the answer. I'm just looking for you to confirm what I already want to do. Um, you know, so the, the, the question is, is, listen to advice with the idea of, of perhaps you can change your perspective. That's, you know, part of what he's trying to do is the wise people are willing to adjust their perspective on, on how they see things. Proverbs 13, 10, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Okay, so now we're, now we're at the crux of it. Why is it that there are times that there's strife? Like you, you want, you know, you can see where people are going down the, the pathway and you're going, this is, this is not going to end well. And, and you probably have been in those situations where you kind of go, whether it's somebody in your business or somebody, one of your friends, and you're going, this is not going to end well, and they are not going to accept my advice. And that's the key, because there's pride has entered into, into the fold of like, are you saying I'm wrong? You're not telling me I'm wrong, right? You're being really judgmental, aren't you? No, I'm here to help you. I've seen this play out before. And so what Solomon is saying is whenever you see strife, whenever you see that tension building, it's because pride has entered the game. And we're going to talk about that. So here's the first thing. If you want to listen, if, if you're willing to listen, then the next big word is to ask, right? The next thing is like if you have a major decision, ask people that know, right? We talked about in a church of this size, having people that you, you're comfortable with saying, hey, I've got to make some major financial decision. I've got to make some major life decisions. Can you help me think this through? Either confirm it or to accept some discipline and saying, hey, I've made the same mistake that you're about to make. Don't do this. Do this, you know, a- adjusting your, your, your perspective. So the question is, is why don't people ask? Why don't people ask? Why do they not want to know? I think that um, the easiest thing for me to relate this to is, is our business. Uh and uh, that particular question. And I think that people don't ask because they don't know what they don't know. Um, It's particularly in my field, we're not kind of, uh, we don't graduate with the anticipation that we're going to open a business. So the Mm -hmm. few of us that do open businesses kind of have to (laughs) figure it out through via Google and other people. Um, And it's the, uh, in my experience, it's the ones who are willing to say, don't know what I'm doing here. Can somebody jump in and help me? Um, or hire somebody to help, um, you know, that are, they're, they're the ones that are succeeding. What I've also noticed, too, is there's a lot of people that are willing to give advice, 
um, or charge you for advice that might just be the most basic thing in the world. So you got to find somebody who you really trust, mm. somebody who kind of understands where you're coming from, from, from the, the heart, um, as opposed to somebody who's just willing to sell you some advice. Because, you know, I, I always tell them, I, I teach a private practice management class and I tell my students, like, you can pretty much find the answer. Everything's a Google click away. It's just, is that the right answer for you? Mm -hmm. And you got to find somebody who understands your heart. So I think that's where the second part is. Like, we don't know what we don't know. But if we're willing to ask, then we know the people who we already trust. And when we ask those people, we're going to get, uh, we're going to, we're going to be able to confide in them a little bit more than we would if it was just like, you know, typing it in Google. Yeah, yeah. I think people don't ask because it's a pride issue and they're embarrassed that they don't know. Um, you know what I mean? Did I read it off your slide? Yeah. It's not up there yet. <laughs> and, and to sort of piggyback on that, it's not just <clears throat> you don't know what you don't know and it's pride. I also think that key word trust, when someone doesn't truly trust another they're afraid to ask because they think the response they're going to get for asking a stupid question is judgment or down talk mm -hmm. instead of true advice or mm -hmm. you know hand holding or walking through the through the decision so yes it's pride yes it's not knowing but i think it's also fear mm -hmm. um, and distrust because they're not sure that the um, voice they're about to hear is going to be one of love and compassion and patience as opposed to admonishment. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, like, as, as going back almost as teenagers about really emotional, uh, relational situations, you know, a lot of times asking, what do you, how do you think this is working out, you know, with a, with a relationship? And I think one of the reasons that a lot of times people don't ask really deeply personal questions is because they already know what you're going to say. They already anticipate, right? I, I, I really don't want to know. And so what wise people know, um, I already know what wise people are going to say, and I don't want to hear it, right? I, I've already, you know, have you ever been in that situation where you already know the path that you want to walk, and you probably know it's a little bit iffy, and so you don't really bring it up because you don't really want people to, to give you that kind of honest feedback. So the first thing is, is there is that sense of embarrassment sense of like going, well, I, I don't want to look foolish, right? I, I ought to know all of this stuff. And of course, the second one is that sense of individuality. I, I'll make my, especially as you kind of move into the, the teens and 20s, I know, right? I'm, I'm my own boss. I'll make my own decisions. It's, it's, it's none of your business. Leave me alone, right? I can do it myself, right? And so we say, um, this is none of your business, and maybe you've, you've dealt with that either with your family or with, with friends of like, just stay out of my business, right? And you're the one that's either with a family member or with friends that are like going, this isn't going to work out well, and it's actually going to be de destructive for you and your family, but stay out of my business. Now, the, f the fundamental truth of that, though, is, you know, all personal decisions tend to have a public consequence. What you decide in private often gets played out in public, right? How, what, the things that you say, it's all about me, this is my decision. That's true, but people that you love, have, it, it has an impact on them as well. And that's where I actually want to invite uh, Kyle. Kyle is going to come up. Yeah, yeah come on up. Um, Kyle's going to tell a little bit about his story, about his transformation that he's had. Um, and this is a picture of Kyle. Actually, I took this um, this week. So this is Kyle. Um, Kyle is the grandson of Dan and Nancy Barton. Yeah, just, yeah, just hang on to it. That's fine. And so Kyle had, has a, an amazing story. If you haven't ever heard Kyle's story, you really got to sit down with him uh, for longer than probably we have. But, but Kyle, tell us a little bit about your journey and the impact that it's had on your life. Well, when I was towards the end of graduating high school or just graduated high school, I was heading down the wrong road hanging out with the wrong groups of people, uh, making a lot of bad decisions. And I got caught up in the partying and the drinking stuff, especially after high school, and made a bad decision to ride a fool with a broken frame because yeah. I wanted to go party that bad and stuff. I uh, ended up giving myself a traumatic brain injury, several bones broken. Uh, but since my accident, I've never 
felt closer to God since all the prayer, power of prayer is definitely real. Yeah. Uh, because if it, I could have died that night, not made it to the hospital, but I definitely feel very blessed and touched by God from him saving me. One of the first times that we really got connected with Kyle is there's a picture of him up in the hospital room. Um, that's where we met, we, we first really got connected with him. It was like, I, he probably has no clue that we were there. And I know that whenever he had that accident, um, it was really touch and go, right? And then uh, whenever I was still, you know, out of it, didn't know where, you know, anything, didn't know where I was, uh, Mom thought I was having a very ser serious spiritual battle, was fighting demons just from the stuff I was saying and doing. Yeah. <clears throat> and you prayed over the phone, on speaker phone, and I opened up my eyes and I had a tear run down my face. Like I said, I was so out of it, I don't remember what I saw, but I told Mom it was the most beautiful thing I ever saw. But I don't know if I caught a glimpse at heaven to relieve my mom, but <laughs> I, uh, I saw something that definitely made it easier on my family. That yeah. way. And everybody was praying. I was on prayer list clear across this country. <laughs> well, I know we, we were praying for you, um, obviously, in those prayers. But, but to, see the to be honest, to see the transformation in him from, from that to the life that he has now, the impact, the testimony. I mean, you know, to, to be able to come up here with, with these two guys, uh, with Mo and Curly, uh, and come up, come up here and share this time uh, is, is really powerful. And so we're really glad that he was able to do that. Um, you know, but you were in that place. If, if we were going to him as, and say, you know, Kyle, you know, this happened, I think this happened like August, about a year and a half ago, right? About a year and a half ago, go to Kyle, Kyle, are you making wise decisions, right? He'd say, first of all, you know, it's my decision, right? You know, I know what's going on. I don't want to hear from you. Sometimes those decisions come back and, and impact you. Yeah, they definitely impacted me in a lifelong uh, serious injuries, but I uh, appreciate God for letting me live and let me live in the capacity that I'm here in, able to walk, talk, you know, eat. <laughs> there for a while I couldn't do, I couldn't eat, couldn't walk, hardly couldn't talk. Yeah. Didn't know really where I was. Yeah. I mean, I feel very blessed to be where I am. And well, the, and, and especially the wisdom that you have now, the depth that you have now, you know, I've Wish I had that depth at your age, um, at that impact. I, but like I said, I was going down the wrong road, and I think God saw something in me and wanted me to yeah. be here for a bigger purpose. Now, yeah. I don't know what that purpose is yet, but <laughs> hope to find it one day. This is part of it. Yeah, definitely. Tell your story. <laughs> yeah. Because basically, what we're talking about is what separates from people from like even hearing your message and saying, well, that doesn't apply to me. I know that that applies to him, but it doesn't apply to me. Is that one bugaboo that constantly came in the garden and, and affects all of us. And it's this thing that we battle over and over again, and it's called pride. And going back to something that Sean had talked about, the reason that people will not take wisdom, counseling, when it's offered to them are, are really two reasons. The first one is this success is intoxicating, right? When life is going well, you're going, I don't need help. I got this all figured out, right? I'm 17, what could go wrong? right? Success is intoxicating. You know, you've probably been in that when people are, are, the sun is shining on them, they can do no wrong. Everybody thinks that they've got the world right where they need it. And the other thing is, is that uh, failure is humiliating, especially, right? Especially for guys, right? We're supposed to be bold and we're supposed to have all the answers. We're supposed to be that rugged individual. And it's like, no, if I have to ask for directions, it means I'm lost. So I'm not going to ask for directions, right? The idea of, of somebody coming to us and saying, I don't know that this is going to work out so well, is hum and we're going to resist it. And so the key is, is that it's not really asking for counsel, it's the pride factor. And it's like, you know, God kind of says, as Solomon is saying, the wise person will listen. Guys, I've been down that. I know the mistakes that you're going to make. Don't go down that path. So here's my solution. Find a mentor. Find somebody that you can say, hey, what do you think? Know what your boundaries are, right? I am who God says I am, right? Otherwise, you're saying, I'll, I'll create it on my own. I can do what God says I can do. Or you'll go back and say, it's what everybody else wants me to be. I'll do whatever my boyfriend or a girlfriend wants me to do. Right? And I can do all things that God 
has created me to be. So here are the three things to find a wise counselor. And this is, and then we'll wrap this up. First of all, find somebody that's neutral, right? It's hard to ask your parents. And do you know why? Because a parents are also emotionally invested in the outcome, right? Find somebody that's going to like going, hey, I don't have a horse in this. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the unvarnished truth of what you're doing. I, that's fine. You don't want to take it? That's fine. But I'm neutral. I'm, I'm, I'm not on one side or the other. It's up to you. Find somebody that's neutral. Find somebody that you respect, right? Because it's hard to take advice from somebody you don't respect. Somebody even that's made the mistakes and said, I have the experience. I know what you're talking about. And then the key is, is somebody that, that loves you. And oftentimes that doesn't mean that they're going to tell you what's easy. They're going to tell you, you know, somebody that really loves you is going to tell you the hard, un, unvarnished truth. This is what I see, right? Good, bad, or indifferent. If you find a friend, they want to keep the friendship over, you know, whatever they have to tell you. So find somebody that's a mentor that you trust to make those life-changing decisions. Now, I tell this to, you know, to, to, to couples. I tell this to, you know, as, as many people. Fundamentally, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't reinvent the wheel. Other people have made these mistakes financially, relationally. They'll look at a relationship. They'll say, this is not, I don't, I don't see this working out. Now, you, you may be so emotionally invested in it that you can't see it. But styles may change. And you might say, yes, but my, my, you know, my, my parents, my mom, you know, she's old school, right? That's not the way I... Yeah, the styles may change, but their purpose has not, right? Relationships always remain the same. So the key, if you want to make wise decisions, find a counselor. Find somebody that you can ask and then listen. So in Proverbs chapter 11, he said, where there is no guidance, people fall. They're destroyed. But in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. And so if we're going to live in this new age, in this new reality, in this wilderness, we need, all of us, need to come together and say, can you tell me the unvarnished truth, right? Can you tell me what's going on in my life? First of all, ask, ask for advice right? If you want to be, do the wise, and then listen to what they tell you. Don't be defensive. Don't say, oh, you don't understand. You don't understand. Because then you're always just trying to say, I already know what the answer is. I just want to find somebody that, that validates what I already want to do. What you want to do is find out God has a plan, and I want to find out what that plan is. Because you are always under attack from your own pride. Your own pride is going to try and separate you from the best life that God has. Well, we've taken a lot of your time, and I hope that somebody will come back, and I'm hoping that somebody listening to this is saying, we need this. We need this now more than ever. Sean, would you close this with a prayer, please? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, every day it could be so easy for us to get discouraged or, or um, find despair, especially given these times most recently, but there's so much to be thankful for. You've given us so many blessings. Just look at Kyle here with us today. He could be feeling sorry for himself and think about all the tragedy that's befallen him over these near lastly two years, but he is standing before these people of yours and saying he is blessed that he has listened to you and your message and he is searching with you and for you in this journey that he has and this hopefully long life he has yet to live. Let that be an example to us all. Let us put away pride. Let us put away fear. Let us be bold in our search for truth and wisdom. Let us be able and humble enough to take advice, to take discipline from those that love us. And may we in turn be bold enough to do that for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for your word, and thank you for surrounding us in those brothers and sisters in Christ because we alone will fail. We are human, fragile vessels, but together in your word and your body and your spirit and surrounding ourselves with others like us in your word in Christ Jesus will make us strong, will make us wise, and we'll do good things in your name. May we continue to do so in all that's holy. Amen. Amen.